What's happening, Reds? It's Jamie Webster here. Just wanted to say, um, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe below. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, this is the Liverpool Connection podcast. I am your host, Daza, and a very special guest today. Um, it brings me back to uh, my childhood, um, the early 80s. I'm a, I'm a 70s kid, but an 80s uh, kid at heart, especially fashion-wise and music-wise. It's, it's some of the best times I ever had in my life. Um, he owns 80s Casuals Limited, um dot co dot uk it is a clothing music book um website uh, and it's all about basically uh football music and fashion and and art um and um what once we get talking a bit later on uh we'll talk about the exhibition that he's got going on in uh at the walker art gallery in liverpool and um, but the liverpool connection uh podcast is pleased to uh bring on dave hewitson how are you mate i'm good thanks thanks for the having us on board be, I, I, be nice to have a little chat about uh the past as as i like doing <laughs> I think we all we could have had another episode that we we're just on for about half an hour. Like <laughs> I should have pressed record because usually some of those are the best ones. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna, just gonna repeat myself, am I? <laughs> ah, no, no, I'm sure you've got you, you got plenty of uh, stories and stuff. But um, let's start out. I mean, one massive reason that that you're on. Um, is because you know you're into the whole eighties terrace culture, but before that you're a red. Well, obviously, yeah, that's, that goes back to me, me dad being a red, and I'm not sure whether his his dad was, but you know, my dad used to go to the game every week. But in the sixties, what they would do, him and um, I think it's probably my uncle, a couple of uncles would go to um, Liverpool, and then sometimes they go to Everton the week after. I don't know whether that was just to have a laugh or whatever. I think it's probably just to go and have a few pints or something. But, you know, Liverpool are hard from the start. And then obviously being born, you know, that's there was only one team I was going to support. But, um, yeah, he, he he started going to away games as well. In, the, in those days, he just jumped in the car, drove down, found out what end Liverpool were going in. Did have like an away end or a home end, obviously, you know, the cop is obviously the home end. The away end would be the Anfield Road. But it was all open. So you get home supporters in there and you get the away supporters in there. So we, I remember probably my first game and I must have been six. And all I remember is a massive big clock and it was at Burnley. So they must, I think it might have been even been called. I don't know what Arsenal was the up clock end, wasn't it? So I'm sure there was a massive clock there. So that's all I remember the game. But in the meantime, I thought going back a year or two, it's 50 years, 1969 this was. So like that was like when I was about six. So I had a look. A, a few years ago when it was the 50th anniversary and we actually beat them 5-1. So it was a good start anyway, like, and then, you know, that was my first game, so it wasn't even at Anfield. And then, like, I remember, like, the 70s, he started to take me to the European home games. Mm -hmm. So the and I do actually remember the Alan Evans Atrich against Bayern Munich. I think it was, it might have been 71. I think we qualified for the Cup Winners Cup because Arsenal done the double. They won the league, so they went in the uh, European Cup. Us being runners up in the FA Cup went into the Cup Winners Cup. But uh, yeah, I remember um, that quarter. I think it was a quarter final as well, and uh, Alan Evans scored it. Scored at Atrich. and from then on, he used to take me in the main stand to all the European home games. So not the league games because I think he'd go with his mates, you know, over Saturday or whatever, and go in the cup and that. So he'd take me to all the European games, right? And then a few away games. I remember going to City in about 74. And um, it was, it, they were all based around holidays. So you had like your Boxing Day, you had your, your Easter holidays as well. I think City was around Easter. I don't know whether it was my mum going right, right. I've had the kids all week, you know, to, 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 let's go to the match and, you know, take them with you or whatever. Like, so, you know, it, it was a good, uh, good start to life as a Liverpool supporter. Like, and obviously, you know, the seventies when I started starting to European games, we won the uh, the UEFA Cup in seventy three, and then he'd you know keep taking me until I started going on my own around about seventy seven or whatever. 
But he did take me to Rome in 77 when I was like 14. And we went on a train, two days, two and a half days there, two and a half days back. You know, one of the things about that trip was, I think there was a rail strike in France. So we had to go the long way around through Belgium and Germany. And so that's why it took so long, two and a half days to get there. But, you know, 20 to 30,000 scousers there or whatever, first European Cup win. And it was just like an honour to have been there. And, you know, I, I haven't missed one since, to be honest with you. I've been to a, every European final since. Oh, uh, well. Well, that's that's part of it, though, is is the trip, isn't it? I mean, oh, the, yeah. the, the yeah, game you know. seems to be, a, you know, sometimes a little bit of an afterthought, you know, because it's you and your mates or your family spending two, three days. And, and usually it's not in aeroplanes. It's oh, on no. trains. On, and, and, oh, well, nowadays, you know, I, I've probably been to about 80 European aways up to now, like, and in the last, say, 15, 20 years, I'm the one who organises them. So I remember, like, organised 18 of us going to Barcelona. We had to get a train from Liverpool to, I think it was Edinburgh, Glasgow, I think it might have been, to Glasgow. Then a flight might have been to um, Porto, then Porto to Madrid. And, like, sorting 18 tickets out and making sure, you know, everyone's, like, being booked on and I, I couldn't relax until I was on the plane and then I, I knew everyone had made it but I've got a little story if you don't mind me telling you a little story about the, that actual trip we get to the, um, the airport in Glasgow and one of the young lads like I think my lad was about 16 17 a couple of the mates their sons were with them but one or two of them had brought their mates so I, I'm you know I'm booking for people I don't even know and this kid turns up and he, he goes to the um show his passport. I'm like, that. come on, everyone over, show your passports. And then uh, the girl goes, you can't get on the plane with that. He had the passport that the photo fell out of as soon as he handed it over. You go, you can't get on the plane with that passport. And we're like, right, the train station's that way. We'll see it in a few days. <laughs> but his mates were like, right, we've got to get him on the plane. So I'm like, right, I'm got, you've got nothing to do with me. We're going over there. We're having a pint. You know, if you get on, we'll see you on the plane. Anyway, we get on the plane and uh, next minute, there he is walking down the, the gangway or whatever. Like, next minute, the uh, air hostess is shouting, hey, hey, where's your ticket? Where's your tickets? Because he didn't have a boarding card. He wouldn't give him one. So anyway, one of the mates is sitting there and goes like that dead quick, passes him a boarding card. He turns around, he goes, oh, this. Oh, right, yeah, okay. But they do a head count. So obviously, as the plane's about to take off, they're going to do a head count. So where all the, his mates stick him under the chair, cover him with their coat, and the plane takes off. This is after 9-11, actually, you know, probably about three years after 9-11 or something. Anyway, the plane takes off, and next minute he gets out the colour of boiled shite or whatever, like, and um, he was there. It was fine. So he gets off, didn't have to show his passport when we got to Barcelona. On the way back, it was a case of, oh, what's happened to your passport? Oh, I fell in the pool. And I had my passport in my pocket, you know, something like that. So, you know, there's, there's mad stories to, you know, every time you go somewhere, like, but thankfully I don't have to be for 18 anymore. I think we're down to about three or four with all the, the way you get the tickets. And I think half of them are growing up and having families now and all that. Don't have the chance to, uh, to get away as often as we used to. Like, uh, It's it's stories like that, though, that, you know, are passed down through generations. Like my, my granddad took me in 76, uh, to right. Anfield, you know, first one, you know, and my memories is the smell of piss. And, <laughs> you know, ba- basically him p- putting me on some somebody else's shoulders while he went, went to the bogs. Uh, and you can't do that these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know what? You can't go to a match nowadays unless you're with someone over the age of 18. So if you're under the age of 18, you cannot go to a game. My first season ticket, 79, so I was 16, just turned 16 or whatever. First season ticket, 16, the Anfield Road ends with all the mates or whatever. And so, you know, bizarrely, these kids now who are growing up, have got, got to wait till they're, you know, 18 to be able to go to the match on their, on their own sort of thing. But, yeah, it's... Um, it's all about the, the cop. My first time in the cop was the uh, Munch and Gladbach final. And um, obviously I'd been going the main stands, but my me, me sister was ill in hospital. 
And the first night that got abandoned because of the rain, we didn't have tickets and it was a so sold out, I think. And my dad said, Oh, we won't be going, we've got to go to the hospital. Your sister's not well, she's only about 10 or whatever. She's been in all day for months. So anyway, we ends up going to the hospital. And then the day after, obviously the game was abandoned, getting played the next day. So I'm going, we're going to the hospital again. I'm going, oh, can we go to the match? Can we go to the match? And all the way to the hospital, I'm saying, can we go to the match? And it, my dad's going, oh, we've got to go to the hospital. I said, it's only 10 pence to get in. It was 10 pence the next day. I think the day before might have been 80 pence or something. I said, because everyone went the day before, it's just 10 pence. Said, I'm not having that. And then it came on the radio, you know, the game was starting. And he said, oh, all these people who are here now, like, oh, only have to pay 10 pence to get in. So anyway, we go to the hospital. We're there for like an hour or so. We're on our way back. Can we go up the ground? Can we go up the ground? So my dad's like, oh, listen, you know, the, the game's kicked off. I said, they had a half-time gate. So when we get home, we drop my mum off. We jumps in the car. We drives up. We get to Anfield. There's a half-time gate, and it was five pence because it was like half the price for half the game. <laughs> and it was in the top of the cop. So we go right up the back of the cop. And he's got me on his shoulders and the noise when he scored. I was just terrified. I was 10, like, but, you know, it's just something you, you don't expect or you're not used to. Being in the main stand for most games, you hear the crowd and the roar and everything, but being there and close to the rafters and listening to that that noise, you know, I was like, put me down, put me down. <laughs> I'd rather not watch the match and, and be sitting up here, like, terrified. Well, yeah, you know, I'd say about experience that like, you don't forget, you know, sort of like 50 years later, still like talking about those memories and, the, you know, the first time in the cup and the first game and everything like that or whatever. Well, I mean, still, you know, when when I go home and I go, I, I still get goosebumps. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the hair still goes up on my arms. It, it's just, it's a sacred place, isn't it? It is, yeah, especially European nights as well. You know, especially when they're, they're, they're coming back, you know, like against Barcelona and games like that. Like, you know, the you, you can't even say the few and far between because, like, you know, my son's only 34 or whatever, like, but he's lived, you know, Istanbul, you know, Barcelona, g- games like that that, you know, other teams' fans maybe see once in a lifetime or something like that. And, you know, we don't, not that we're used to it, but it's just um, become a part of our history, doesn't it? Yeah, it just seems to happen at Anfield. Like, I don't know what it is. I mean, obviously the twelfth man with the with the cop pull, pulling, you know, the goal. But you know, it obviously makes does you know do something with the players. You know, you, you look at them games when it was in lockdown or whatever. Was it six games on the run? We got beat at home or something ridiculous like that. And, you know, that that would never have happened. Other than the crowd yeah, that, was there. Well, that's a you know. <laughs> When Evertonians brag about beating us at Anfield and all that, and I'm like, yeah, but no one was there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of your fans saw it, and yeah. one of our fans saw it. So I mean, you just chalk it off. It was just that that, that shows to me, like, I mean, it, it, it. The only good thing I thought about watching those games was you, you could actually hear the players. You could actually hear Hendo yeah. screaming yeah. At, at you know. Uh, like Van Dyke and Milner and all that, that was good. But there was no soul without, yeah, without yeah, fans, yeah. and that, that kind of told me, like, you know, FA, are you watching? Because football without fans, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, like you say about the players, shouting, all they give you a good insight to <clears throat> being a professional footballer and you know playing on the on the pitch. But you know, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you can mic up some players and you could hear them with, uh, you know, you wanted to get a good sense of it with a the crowd there. Like, but, you know, the, I don't need to go, well, who knows what will happen in football, the way they, they run things nowadays. Anything could happen, couldn't it? Like, well, all, all I'd like to know is, uh, you know, put a mic on, on the referee talking to VAR officials. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. I would like. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. that, that whole Michael Oliver just apologising to, to Klopp about the Arsenal game. Why? Why apologise? Yeah. He lost yeah. his points. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. He had the chance on the day, didn't he, to sort it like but Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Never when I first came in, I thought, you know, that, I thought, VAR, that's, that's going to stop the arguments down the pub. Oh, that wasn't a goal. That was offside or whatever. It's, it's, it's just still there, isn't it? So, you know, it's, yeah, you know, 
I don't think things are going to change. Is it this World Cup that they're going to use some sort of other technology? The VAR, but the so computer the system is, yeah, the computer system is probably 50 times better than someone drawing lines on the telly or whatever, like, yeah. It, it is, but again, I, I, I just feel like with VAR, it, it's it's human-based as well. Yeah. So yeah. You, you've got, you know... Well, if they make a mistake, why, why have it in the... In the first yeah. place, anyway, you might as well just go back to having a referee or whatever. It's you know the, the mistakes are still getting made, so you know it, it hasn't cleared up it up that much. But yeah, it's, it's cleared it up a bit. But yeah. So Dave, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who who was your uh, um your poster poster boy? <laughs> and my mine was Barnsley and and King Kenny. Douglas, yeah, Douglas for me. I remember the day, and I, <clears throat> I was. I was used to have the milkman and he used to get the paper every morning and it, you, you never had obviously social media or you, you had no inkling of what was going on behind the scenes at Anfield or anywhere else. And then just to pick up that paper and then on the back page, 440,000 Dagley signs for Liverpool. Because I liked them before that. You know, when you're seeing them playing for Celtic or whatever and they'd win the league every year or whatever, I thought, oh, he's some player in like, And then for us to sign them, you know, Keegan, amazing, you know, Rush, even Owen, you know, we've had some magnificent players in our time, but, you know, he, he, he for me, was the, like, number one. And going back 10 years, it, when it was when I was 50, a mate of mine, his son knows him well and lives around the corner. I think he's formed me. And he, um, he got a signed retro share for me off Kenny, off, like, to Dave, Happy fiftieth! Have a great day or something, oh, wow. <laughs> Kenny. <laughs> so yeah, he's he's uh, always been a favourite, and even more so after that. <laughs> I I think it's it's more with 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 Kenny. It, it's not just his football. It's just oh, yeah. he really cares about yeah. He does does the football he? club. He really cares about scousers, and you know we, we we've seen it quite a few times. I mean the Hillsborough, and yeah. then. Yeah. When when he came back, uh, you know, under Hex and Gillette, yeah, and, uh, right. you know, it, 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 he's I, it, he's probably because I can talk to anyone, but if he was in front of me right now, I I would not know what to say. <laughs> he's just you got so much to say, but you wouldn't know <laughs> what. Bits yeah, to it, say. it just wouldn't come out. It just yeah, wouldn't yeah. come out. No, I, yeah. I, I'm 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 in awe of the man. He's yeah, just done so yeah. much for, for the city of Liverpool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, you just, you, again, you know, there's all that, that cliche saying, you know, never meet your heroes. Yeah. I hope yeah. one day I get to meet him, at least shake his hand and just tell him thank you. Because, uh, yeah, that's, you know, footballers, that's all you need to do, isn't it? You know, just basically thank them for entertaining us you know you, you you pay your money but you 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 do get entertained particularly by by what he'd done in the past and everything like that but yeah it's um yeah moving forward like you know so as i say got me first season ticket 79 and then from then on it was just like home and away for a good few seasons to like you know probably 83 84 something like that but yeah, all the European games, as, as many European aways as I could muster or whatever. And after that's, as I, I suppose you want me to get on to the initial book that are done, the Liverpool boys are in town. Uh, the one the one that falls apart. Well, it did do, didn't it? You know why that, well, you know why that happened? I'll tell you the story behind that. I, was, I worked as a printer for 38 years until probably about six years ago. And I had this idea around about 2003, I think it was, there's a lot of hooligan books coming out. And basically, I was thinking, none of these books, I read one or two, and none of them mentioned the fashion. It was all about the fighting outside and on the terraces and whatever. Like, and you know, that wasn't a big, a big part of it for me. You know, a big part of it for me was the fashion. And it was like it's like a catwalk. So you, you wanted the latest trainers, you wanted the latest jeans. And then you go to the Alfred Road end and, you know, you'd be standing there with your mates and you'd be looking at what other people are, are wearing and, you know, things would be in for a week and then they'd be out and then it'd be another different pair of jeans. And and so for me, it was all about the fashion as well as, you know, obviously watching your team. 
And so basically, like I say about the book, the um, with working in the printers, I thought, right, I'll start putting something together. So every night on the computer, I'm typing something out, thinking about one thing. And it's like any any person you probably speak to, they remember the first match, the first time they went to the pub, the first time they started work, what they done with the wages. And so basically this kicked off, this fashion, around the late 70s when I started work, I left school, started work, started going to match on my own or with the mates or whatever. And so started going to the pub and everything. So you remembered little, every little aspect of that, even though like, you know, I think it's like 2003. So yeah, I was like 50 or whatever. So that was like, you know, quite a few years earlier. But, it was, you know, you'd ask me then what have you... What happened a month before, and I probably wouldn't remember. But ask me what happened like thirty years earlier. I was like, yeah, we used to go to this pub, and then we'd play a game of pool, Space Invaders, and then we'd go to this other pub or whatever. And then you'd see someone in a pair of trim trap, and you think, where did you get them from, or something? So, so that that the idea came to me. I thought, to start, I'll put this together because no one's done it up to yet. And with being a printer, I thought, right, I, I, I'll do a, a late shift. I see what I can get printed. So I ended up printing 300 books, bringing them all home individual individual pages, stacking them up in the kitchen and binding them myself with glue. So and then sticking them all together. And I'm thinking, all I need to do is these 300 books, then that'll be it. No one will probably buy it. So we'll just see what happens. So anyway, I done the 300 books. And if you remember the um, the Ellsbury shop by Anfields. So I said, yeah, it's 20 books, you know, sell them, keep the money towards the uh, the campaign and that like. And so um, i done that. And then I just thought, I'll pop in every now and again. So about two or three weeks later, I popped in again and the fellow goes, um, Jerry, he goes to me. He said, Dave, he said, I said, what, what? He said, where have you been? I said, what are you talking about? He said, everyone's coming in for that book. We sold out in about two days or whatever. He said, everyone's been coming in asking for that book. I thought, oh, I'll have to get some more printing. <laughs> I was like, I've been giving them out to everyone. Yeah, I'll have a read of that. You know, that'll take you back or whatever. So I ended up, I think initially, I ended up doing about 2,000 and got rid of them. And then 2009, the local um, book place, um, Blue Coat Press, I don't know if you remember them, they, um, they've done a lot of local books. So I got to know the guy there and he said, yeah, we'll do, we'll do 2,000 as well. So I've done another 2,000 then. And um, produced, um, done them, had a bit of a launch in Static Gallery in town and uh, ends up getting rid of them as well. But in the meantime, what kicked in was the, the, the clothing label and everything. So that all kicked in and I've started doing T-shirts and sweatshirts and everything. And so the, that, that was sort of what, you know, I thought I'm not going to sell much more than that to 4,000 or whatever by the end of it. Like, done all okay with that. Obviously, the... Um, the, the fashion side of it kicked in and the clothing label. And it wasn't until recently with having this exhibition coming along that I thought, oh, I might as well redo it, get a new cover on it, add a few more words or whatever. Peter Newton done a little bit about the retro scally look or whatever around the mid mid 80s and that. I got an intro into it and everything like so. Um, I just thought I'd you know, bring it out again. So I'd done another uh, few hundred a few weeks ago or whatever. And there. Uh, the museum, the, well, the gallery have took hundred off me, and I've I've sold, I think, uh, two or three hundred up to now as well. Like so, it's uh, plumbed along nicely or whatever. A lot, lot but, better binding this time, eh? Well, exactly. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what I was building up to. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I've got myself to blame initially, but now everyone who bought that one initially have to buy it again now because the first ones fell apart. Well, so this one should last. Well, how long do you want to have a book? You know, you're talking like, ooh, 17 years ago, 18 years ago, first done it. So it's bound to fall apart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that might be a good market employ. It is, yeah. Well, you, well, you know, a little story, and I've heard this story, you know, Adidas Samba. Yeah. When they first, they've been around for years and years, well before the 70s, because they were five-a-side five football trainers, but they were that made. They lasted for years and years. So when all the casual culture kicked off and people started wearing samba again, Adidas sort of skimped a little bit on the uh, the quality, we think, because, you know, the, the, the souls would go. You know, you weren't even playing football in them. You were only walking the streets or whatever. So I think, and then they started getting made in the Far East, mid-80s. 
So what what happened there? Like the, you know, it's it's a it's a market employee, isn't it? Which <laughs> I got onto by mistake, but <laughs> whether the dealers do it for real, I don't know. Like, <laughs> oh, I think they do. Uh, you know, I uh, like I've got loads of pairs and quite a few of them. Like the reissues. Oh so, yeah, the soles are terrible. Yeah, well, there's a pair there, um, and they look quite new that I've got in the exhibition at the Walker, and it's a pair of Adidas Grand Slam. The ones with the pegs in the back. Now I remember having them like 1981. Little story there. Went to the Paris final in 81. Didn't have much in the, the way of trainers or anything. So we um England were playing Switzerland in uh Baal two days later. And I think McDermott played and you know he played in the final on the Wednesday as well. So on the Friday, Thursday night or whatever, he gets the train down to Baal. Because it was on the border with Germany, so we knew there'd be a sports shop over the border in Germany, and we'd be able to get the trainees we were after. So we went across the border. I got a pair of these Grand Slam, but I'm being honest with you. Six months later, they'd worn where the pegs were, you know, because it was only thin where the sole was because the pegs went through. And uh, you know, the pegs obviously were part of the tennis culture of you know creating trainers to play better tennis in or whatever like. But, you know, we were just wearing them for the match and running around in them. And uh, next minute, I think, you know, the souls have gone on them. But the ones in the uh, the museum or in the gallery, they look new. And they've got a, uh, they've got all cracks on the soul. You know, like, obviously, I don't know if it's just over time, you know, that's another story about the uh, the souls crumbling. But, you know, they are 30, 40 years old, aren't they? Some of them, like, you know, something's going to happen to them in that, that time. But if you want me to talk about the, uh, the, the that culture, it, I think fashion was changing. So you had punk, which came around in the late, you know, 76, then, and straight jeans and narrow pants sort of came in. You, you know, your dad would have a big, massive collar on his shirt that was, like, made of acrylic or something. Then cotton shirts with small collars came in and V-neck jumpers and round-neck jumpers by Slanger and Pringle and whatever. They, they sort of made an appearance. And so that that sort of fashion sort of kicked in with people going the match. And so, you know, you're talking 78, 79, the Anfield Road where we'd go, they, they were all kids. They were all like 16 to 22 or whatever. All dressed similar. And it stood out because, you know, you went in the cop or you went to an away game somewhere else and everyone was wearing these big mad flared jeans and you know, the mad shirts and donkey jackets, which, you know, you usually seen the bin men in donkey jackets, but it became a fashion item in a lot of these uh, northern towns or whatever. Maybe they were, you know, bin men or they work down the mines or whatever. Like, But, you know, the fashion changed and Liverpool was at the, the core of it. You know, the, the kids going the game was sort of, you know, it was like a fashion catwalk, you know, what everyone was wearing. And so when we go to like you know down to London or across to Sunderland, Newcastle or wherever, we stood out. You know we stood out because of the way we were dressed. There's you know a little story about uh, Aberdeen coming to Anfield in 1980, November 1980, and a guy actually wrote a book. He was one of the hard men, say, who wrote a book about the Aberdeen and all they how they got on with all the uh, hooliganism and everything like. But he said we came to Anfield. And they just stood in awe, looking across at all these like 16 to 20 year olds with a flicked air cut, a wedge, it was called. And um, the clothing and the styles that they hardly watched the match. They were just like in awe of all these Liverpool fans. And they they took that back to Scotland and that spread in Scotland. So like I say, by Liverpool being the core of it, that's basically the start. So by the say, Christmas of, say, 1980, you had like a, a pair of um, Adidas strapovers. Now strapovers was like oh, quite common. Now kids wear them; you can't tie the laces. But then they were like something like, "Oh, where did you get your trainees from?" And it appeared that they came from Germany. Someone been to Germany, come back with these strapover trainers. Next minute, everyone everyone needed a pair. Everyone wanted to have a pair. And then over oh, uh, a couple of months, a few shops in town got them. Sports shops. So obviously with the shops having them in town, the next thing was you needed something from abroad. If they'd come from abroad, there must be other trainers. Britain was in recession. They only had, you know, your black and white trainers, Stan Smith, 
your Samba, Mamba and Bamba or whatever. And when we got uh, Munich in the European Cup in April of 81, probably about 2,000 kids went over, you know, like probably about three or 4,000 Liberal fans, but about 2,000 and were probably aged 16 to 22 or something went over. And you're like, it was like your trainers there, the array of colours was just unbelievable. Britain was still in black and white. When we went to Europe, it was like these array of colours, even polo shirts, pink and lemons and everything like that. It was basically brown or some like 1970 orange colour over here or whatever. And then, um, so that, that culture sort of evolved then to want something from abroad that you couldn't get here. And like I say about the shops in Liverpool, you probably had four or five sports shops in the whole of Liverpool. So a legacy of that became, you know, Wade Smith opened. That's a, a, a story in itself. Other sports shops opened, selling, you know, going to get trainers to bring back to selling in Liverpool because the, the demand was that much. You know, the, the, the kids themselves, until Wade Smith opened in 82, Liverpool fans were going abroad when Liverpool weren't even playing just to get training shoes and sportswear to bring back to sell to the mates to make a little bit of money. So an entrepreneurship sort of kicked in as well at the same period. And, you know, from then on, you know, sportswear became the next big thing with Fila and Sergio Tacchini and all Italian brands. So you then you needed the sportswear that, you know, came from Italy. We went to, I think it was, we played Alkmaar uh, in the European Cup, 81, uh, November 81, I think it might have been, or October. And we went over there to Amsterdam because the game got switched because Alkmaar Stadium wasn't big enough, so it was in Amsterdam. So the first thing we done when we got to Amsterdam was go to a sports shop and, you know, look for feeler and feeler uh, ski jumper and, you know, Adidas, V-neck, Lendl or whatever that you, we knew you couldn't get in Liverpool because there was only four or five sports shops in Liverpool and you'd be around everyone looking for, yeah. for stuff, but there wasn't anything there. Like So like I say about that culture, that's what I wrote the book about, that sort of came to mind that no one had done it. No one had wrote, the, wrote a book about the fashion. And I wanted to do it before, say, some Manchester or London or Cockney or whoever turned around and said, we were doing this, you know, in 1974 or something ridiculous like that. So it was getting in there first as well. Well, you see it though, like you've seen documentaries where, you know, Chelsea fans will say, you know, we we started the casual culture. I'm like, no, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. They, they, I've read stories, as you say, about yeah, um, taxi drivers were wearing Gabichi V-neck jumpers or whatever, like, but yeah, that wasn't a, a terrace item, you know. It was like just them buying a jumper to keep warm and the driving around or whatever. So, I mean, most, most of those lads look like scar boys to me. Like, yeah, you know, lots, oh, yeah. And then, then you've got uh, the man yeah. look like Bay City Rollers. Yeah, well, in 1980, uh, 1980, we played Tottenham. Remember the sixth round of the Cup? And we had the whole end at Tottenham. must have been 8,000. And we come out and we got escorted down to Seven Sisters, which must be a mile and a half away. Although it felt like 10 miles because we're getting a police escort because obviously all the trouble that's going on at the time. On the other side of the road must have been 10,000 Cockneys because I don't think any London team had a home match that day. So every hooligan in London turned up. But there was a difference. It was like, a fashion parade of all the scousers on one side in the narrow jeans and the, you know, the wedge hair style and all looking dead smart. And then on the other side, there was skinheads and boneheads and, you know, people in donkey jackets and, and all sorts. So, you know, you, you've only got to look at photos and stuff like that of, of years gone by. And a lot of, you know, other teams, they've got photos, yeah, this is us at the match or whatever, you know, and they've got Fila and Tikini on or whatever. It's 1983, the photos from, you know, me and the mate and a few others within Amsterdam in 81, October 81, getting feeler there or whatever. And I know, know some of them will say, obviously, that, yeah, there's, um, there were sports shops in London selling that stuff or whatever. But it wasn't worn to the match as, 
you know, as as was done in uh, on Merseyside sort of thing. But you know, you know, gives you know, I'm sure there's one or two who who will, and it was slower building down there or whatever, and and in other places or that. But um, yeah, it's, it's just like as I say, going back to the book, that was one of the main reasons to done it. So it's basically chronological in like in a sense of like starting in '77 when punk fashion sort of came and changed a few things, and then you know the build up to going to Europe and up to about '83, '84 when it sort of became mainstream. And then you know every team had their dresses and fashionistas or whatever. Like so, you know, it was sort of I remember about '83, '84 seeing like. She must have been a grandmother. She must have been 60 odd. She had a pair of training shoes on. So yeah, I was thinking to myself, oh, that's gone too far now. You know, I don't think we'll, uh, we'll wear training shoes anymore. So, but, you know, that's suddenly changed, hasn't it? You know, sort of everyone wears training shoes. But that's that legacy that I'm trying to make a point about is the fact that, you know, from going to Wade Smith opening and there being five or six shops in Liverpool, sports shops, you go down one street in Liverpool now, there's probably three or four sports shops and all the designer shops sell training shoes as well. And that legacy is sort of, you've got big brands like, you know, Gucci nowadays, you know, Dior, Balenciaga. In the mid 80s, towards the late end of the 80s, these like fashion houses like Prada and Hugo Boss didn't have a sports line so they didn't do training shoes they didn't do track suits they wanted to sell suits and shoes but then suddenly they're thinking we must be we're losing out here everyone in britain's wearing training shoes and then suddenly you've got prada sport you've got hugo boss sport so you know i do think that was a part of that legacy of liverpool fans just going to europe getting a few pairs of trainers now you've got these big, you know, high-end hood, hood couture <laughs> brands sort of selling training shoes and, you know, making a ton of money out of it or whatever. But so it's a story I wanted to tell. And it's a story that, you know, I've put in the book. But little did I re- realise it will build up to what's happening today with this exhibition, you know, with the walk and all whatever. Like. I mean, it, it must be, well, we haven't even said the name of the book. <laughs> the Liverpool boys are in town. So there used to be a, a song called We Only Drink Whiskey and Bottles of Brown, the Liverpool boys are in town. So that I just took that from there. And then it's subtitled The Birth of Terrace Culture. So that was sort of to um yeah, without that happening in Liverpool, you know, would things have been different, you know, across England, Europe or whatever, because of the air. Uh, the sports way that's worn or whatever, but yeah, it, it's just it just ties in nicely with what I'm, I'm thinking in my own head that uh, you know all these brands are only doing it because of us us going to Europe in the uh, the early eighties. I just saw the abomination of of Gucci and Adidas together. Uh, they did. Oh no, yeah. yeah. Well, you just thought that would happen, you know. It's, it's uh, kids will buy. You know, it's it's we. I think we've got a lot to answer for as well because when all the designer sportswear came in, it, it was really expensive. It was more than a week's wages or whatever, but you'd, you'd want it, you'd have to buy it or, you know, other people would get it by other means or whatever. But, you know, that the kids nowadays from the age of six know what they want to wear. You know, when I was like probably 12, me, me my mom was probably still dressing me or whatever, you can't tell a 12 year old nowadays what to wear or whatever. You know, they, they know themselves and what the mates are wearing and what they all want to wear. But that's the great thing about Liverpool as well. It has its own take on style and fashion. Okay. So, what we done then and what we wore, you know, kids nowadays, you know, obviously in Liverpool, they've got their own take on fashion. They're not like we weren't, um, we didn't have like, magazines really telling us what to wear and you know or you know social media or whatever but the kids have got all that but still in Liverpool they still uh, ignore it they'll ignore what London's wearing they'll just wear what they want to wear which you know good on them like it's uh, you got their own individuality I would say Liverpool looks way towards Ireland and America whereas you know we've got our back to the rest of England sort of and you know we, we take our uh, inspiration from elsewhere yeah, it used to be for me, um, you know, 
like we were talking earlier. I mean, I, I my parents would be like, I'm not buying you that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd be in the Dunlops or, or the Adidas that has four stripes. Right. <laughs> um, you know, one, once I started on the U, U training scheme, you know, I saved up and up and up. And that then it, I'd, it, I'd yeah. go to Wade Smith, I'd go to St. John's Market, you know, yeah. and buy buy the trainees that I wanted. Um, I had a paper me. round. I had a paper round, you know, uh, of a weekend. And then during the week, like I said earlier, I got the milkman. So so that was just like to, to get you to the match and to get like the, you know, pair of trainers or whatever to the start of work, which was ooh, 1980, February 80, yeah. But yeah, yeah you don't want you, you have to, to try and uh, keep up with the fashion, shall we say. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I I had two older lads on, on my street and, you know, I'd, I'd watch them, their clothing. But it, it was more like an individual thing as well. It, it wasn't more about, like, what everyone's doing. It was yeah. like, you know, I, I like that style. It feels comfortable, you know, wearing yeah. chainies every day. It, it was just normal growing up like that. And uh, yeah, well, that, that filters down, doesn't it? You know, obviously you, you've got the older lads who you know by the mid eighties, really, you know, dressing a bit different as well. Like, and then it filters down to their brothers and their mates, and then kids in school and everything. But I'm surprising, you know, it's surprising, you know, the amount of people who you know are coming out of that exhibition saying, "Oh, it, it took them back to when they were actually in school," which is like. You know, they're probably a bit younger than me, but even in school, he wanted like the, the latest trainers that uh, the older lads had at the match and that. Like, yeah, yeah it, it's a great period. And, um, you know, I'm glad you brought up the exhibition. Uh, again, it's called Art of the Terraces and it's a Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. So, how, how did that come about? Um, was it just you specifically, or did you have a partner where you went, look, I want to do do something like this? Well, what happened initially, let's, let's go back to probably about 2009. And no, and in fact, 2008 was Capital of Culture. And probably a year before that, I and a, 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 a partner of mine in the business approached um, the, the walker about doing an exhibition about clothing. So all the trainers and all the clothing were worn. And for one thing or another, there was a new museum getting built and politics and whatever. So it never happened. Let's go back six years now. And then three guys who are co-collaborators on this, two are from Othersfield, um, Peter O'Toole and Adam Gill, they're like illustrators, designers. And then one guy from Germany, Jens Wagner. And the three of them had an idea of trying to get an exhibition about football culture. And they brought me in and said, listen, you know, we'll bring you in. You you go back a bit. You're a bit older than us. <laughs> you, you'll remember a bit more than, you know, you'll remember the 80s, we remember the 90s sort of thing. And I said, well, to be honest with you, it's a wide spectrum. You're talking football culture. You're talking footballers. And besides, you know, people who go to the match, and yeah, it's a wide spectrum to cover. I said, but I know the curator of the gallery now in Liverpool that we could approach, but from a different point of view. So rather than just have an exhibition of a load of trainers and a load of jackets say, and clothing, our best option would be the art of the last 15 years has dramatically been, you know, it's taken inspiration from that 80s period. So, you know, you've got people doing trainers as a piece of art on a canvas, only ever done, I think, by Warhol. I've only ever seen him do a, a converse on a trainer in the mid 80s, I think it was. But besides him, the guy who done it, Dave White, is from Liverpool. And this is 2003. He had an exhibition in London, Adidas versus Nike. And so his inspiration was when he was a kid in school, what all these trainers. So besides him, then you've got Pete McKee, who's like similar age to me. He does stuff that's reminiscent about, you know, the 70s, 80s, and then you've got other people. Mark Leffy is a Turner Prize winner. He done a video called Fiorucci Made Me Hardcore, which has got Northern Soul. But I think it's the first piece of art with casuals in. So what he's done is he's took clips off certain TV programmes 
like maybe the news or look northwest or something like that and put them all together splice them all together put a bit of music over and then when he gets to the casuals bit he starts naming all the labels Burberry, Aquascutum, Stone Island or whatever and goes through all these labels so I thought that's magnificent it's a it's a piece of art but it's associated with casuals and that was made in 1999 so that's over 20 years old so since then, all this art has evolved into like what you get now. And I can see behind you, trainers on a print, is artists using that inspiration from the 80s and the clothing and the trainers, obviously, to create pieces of art that are now being used in advertising and being used in shops. To like, um, there's a, a collage artist, Shauna Gavin. And she'd done a collage because a store in the Baltic in Liverpool, they were releasing the Adidas Paris trainer. So they wanted a bit of retro artwork for it. So they got in touch with her. She got in touch with me. I sent her a few photos. She's cut them all out, made a collage of them with like the pyramids in the background and the desert and the airplane and all sorts. And it's magnificent, like, and that's a part of the exhibition. So I said to the guys, I said, listen, we'll approach the gallery with this idea of, besides, obviously, the fashion, it's now taken another step. There's another legacy to it. There's guys who are artists who are similar age or a little bit younger than me who are using their youth as inspiration for their art. And, it, you know, it's become, like, sort of a little bit mainstream because you've got, like, designers who own clothing stores or uh, websites creating T-shirts with images of trainers and stuff like that. So once we approached the, uh, the gallery with that, he took it on board straight away because he thought, well, there's a new demographic of person that'll come to the gallery. You know, you're going to get fellas who are reminiscing about the 80s and when they were young and used to go to the match and used to buy them types of clothes they're going to bring the kids. You're going to get your art types who are into art. So it'll be an inspiration as well for, you know, artists who are like, oh, I don't know what direction to go. Actually, in that exhibition, there's a tapestry piece of art. There's video. There's photography. There's um, paintings, obviously. There's collage. There's a, there's a piece of everything, you know, sort of like what, what avenue do we go around if we want to be an artist? There's a piece of everything in there as well, which surprised us in the end because I, I initially when we approached the, uh, the gallery, we had about six artists in mind. And then next minute we go over and see the gallery and it's massive. There's like three rooms. And we're like, how are we going to fill this? But, you know, we sat down over six years it took, sat down every so often. And we'd come up with like, right, I found this artist. He, you know, he's doing, there's a guy from Kirby, Liverpool, and he, we, my dad found him online. He said, have you seen this guy? He'd be good for your, for your exhibition. I said, who is he? So I had a look, Steve Randall. And he's from Kirby. So he does stuff associated with Kirby, but from the 80s. So there's an old pub with the block of flats in the background. But the kids in the in the picture have got like an Adidas Kagool on or a pair of kickers. And so, you know, without sort of... I'm going to be an artist that's inspired by the 80s. He was just doing it anyway. He wasn't like, he didn't see, oh, there's a bit of a movement going on here that I want to be a part of. He was just doing it anyway. And I think a lot of people have. There's like Ross Muir from Scotland. There's some amazing paintings. But basically, I seen them online and thought, that's a Van Gogh. But all he's done is Photoshop three stripes on the sleeve. No, he actually paints them. So it gives a different perspective when you look at it. You know, that's a Van Gogh. Oh, no, it's not. And, he, and he's going to do this jacket on. But, but so, you know, that that inspiration of it's it might only be sportswear to him. He might not have been. I don't think he's old enough to have lived through the 80s like we, we did. But it's the fact that us going to get trainers from abroad, bringing them back, a whole new sports culture, athleisure wear, you know, led on from that, that he's inspired by athleisure wear to put Adidas stripes on a, a Van Gogh or Grace Jones is another one that he's done with uh, the stripes on the sleeve and all that. Like, and his paintings go for a few more nowadays. Like, <laughs> but it's only the last like four years he's been painting. Well, was, was it hard though to, you know, pick 
which ones because I'm I'm sure there was tons and tons of stuff that you that you've left out. Oh, well, to be honest with you, the, I don't think we left a lot out. We we obviously had to pick the best and what we thought you know would suit the gallery and that. And trying to cover not just like training shoes used as art or whatever. So, you know, put a different spin on it with different other stuff and that like. So, you know, we've, we haven't left a lot out, but, you know, I, th- I think we've got the best bits. I think we've got like, you know, we, we approached, um, every artist wants to be in a national gallery. So it's, it is, it is a national gallery and it's probably the second, as the second biggest collection outside of London. So you've got London, then you've got Liverpool Walker with the second biggest collection of paintings. And, you know, if you go in there, it's worth a visit, even if that wasn't on. You've got Rubens and Rembrandt and, you know, these 17th, 16th century paintings that are amazing, and like 10 foot by 20 foot. And, and people are stunned that are going to the exhibition for the first time to never been in here before. Isn't this building amazing? You know, when you walk inside and you have a look around and everything, but you go upstairs through a room or two, and then you get to our exhibition and like, you know, it, it, you know, it, it obviously touches people as well. Like, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been, it's been great. And it's been well, re- well received. I mean, you've got to be very proud of it. Oh, well, you know what? It's sort of the pinnacle, isn't it? You know, like you can write a book, so, yeah, everyone can write a book. You can start a label and, you know, start selling T-shirts. You could do that overnight. You could put a trainer on a T-shirt and start selling them overnight. But, you know, to get in a national gallery, you know, I, I walked around with this Scottish guy, Ross Moore, and he's still putting posts up on Instagram saying, I t- I'm just stunned that I'm in this gallery, you know, this National Museum's gallery or whatever. And the Kirby guy, Steve Randall, he was saying... He puts a painting up now and it gets bored straight away. <laughs> you know, it's like, but um, it's just like little things like that. That's, as you say, makes you proud that like, you know, the, we haven't done it for ourselves to make, you know, to, to feel good about it. You know, it's just like another story that needs to be told that maybe we're the first to do again. Like writing that book and being the first to put a book out about the fashion. It was the same with, the display in the the exhibition in the gallery, it was wanting to be the first to say, listen, this is a little bit of a movement. It's like a bit of a pop art movement because a lot of art is inspired still by pop art. And a lot of the art in the exhibition is probably inspired by pop art, but not from the terraces. You know, this pop art, you know, might have clothing or trainers on it, but it's a, to me, it's a new sort of form of pop art. You know, Warhol and Lichtenstein had their own sort of the comics and the Brillo pads or the Campbell soup or whatever, you know, throw away stuff. And it's the same with us, you know, it's, you know you're supposed to throw your trainees away when you're supposed to throw your jackets away when it's knackered. And now we're like sort of, you know, they become collectible pieces. They're a bit of art within themselves. But now that people are doing art inspired by that as well, and, you know, they're appearing in other galleries besides the uh, the Walker. It's just like, yeah, it's just, they they are so made up with it. And I'm, I'm made up that they're made up. You know, I, I get a, a little update off the uh, curator now and again, explaining like, oh, she's, oh, I've had an email off such and such. And um, oh, what a great night that was when they had the opening and they've been back since and they'll go back again with the family and everything like that. So it's good. And it's good for them. Liverpool, you know, it's 200 yards from uh, Lime Street. You come out of Lime Street, say you go on the game, 200 yards to your right is, is the gallery. And I've, I've mentioned that a few times on social media. And when you walk on out the gallery, one of the rooms, there's all post-it notes. So you can leave a little comment. And, you know, we played Derby in the uh, League Cup or whatever last week. And there's like half a dozen Derby stickers, you know, post-it notes of people saying, oh, awesome, you know, brilliant exhibition and stuff like that. That's the good bit, you know, sort of people coming I'm not expecting to see 500 pairs of trainers and 500 jackets. They're actually taken in with the art as well. So, you know, art's for everyone. And hopefully, you know, the, the, the walker will get a new audience and, you know, it, it'll inspire people as well, hopefully. Like. Now, you said it runs till March 12th to... March 12th, yeah. Right. So it's if- closed on Mondays. 
So don't pop over from America for a Monday and then go back and then it's short life. So yeah, it's closed on Monday, but it's open every other day. <laughs> it's open every other day. Um, so uh, we've talked about that. Now, what about your, your 80s casuals? Um, how how did that come about? Is it obvious? That actually came about because of the book. I um, Obviously, once I've done the book, I thought someone said to me, he said, I mean, being to, to Suti in Chester, they, they'll probably sell it as a Liverpool lad works there. So I took the books there. I'm showing them the book and all that. He said, oh, yeah, give us a give us a dozen. We'll sell them here for you. And it was Mike, this guy who worked there. And then I'm walking out the shop with him and I see a row of T-shirts that have got Sim Trab on the front, just one colour. And it was a Fruit of the Loom T-shirt. And I'm walking out and I says to Mike, I says, are these your T-shirts or a Fruit of the Loom doing T-shirts with tram, Tim Trabs on? That's brilliant, that. And he says, oh, no, we, we've started a little label, like 80s Casuals, it's called. This is our first one or whatever. You know, we've got a couple of designs, just like trainers on T-shirt. I think they put a, a, a Millie Millie jacket on as well, a, a CP company a Millie jacket or whatever on, on one of the T-shirts. So she says, oh, you can do better than that, just one colour. I said, the, the wife works in the printers. I said, you can get like five or six colours, a bit of embroidery on the sleeve get a proper label in the back. So in the end, within like two or three months, I became a part of their little, you know, let's just do a few T-shirts we can sell in our own shop and sell a few on eBay. So we became like a bit of a... I started this label, basically, to sort of see where it took us. And we knew we could sell them into Suti. We knew we could sell them on eBay. And I thought, right, I'll, there's a, someone mentioned a shop in Manchester called Ran. They ended up opening one in Liverpool, actually. So I went up to Manchester, took a couple of books. Will you sell this book for us? Although it's a Liverpool book, he said, yeah. I said, what about these T-shirts? Oh, they're brilliant, then. He said, yeah, well, we'll take some of them off, yeah. So anyway, it gives him a few T-shirts. And um, within the space of a week or two, he was back on the phone to me. He said, oh, have you got any more of them T-shirts? And slowly, we went from doing a trim trap to like doing a tomahawk and doing a, you know, a gazelle. To, we must have done about like 50 different, every every week we were going, right, what trainer could we do now and put on a T-shirt? And the sales just kept, kept, kept going up. And next minute, a guy comes on board, he wants to like supply shops. So that's how we sort of built from there. Mike's gone his own way now. Jay, who was my other partner six years ago, he moved on to Transalpino and he's working with him now. So I sort of bought him out. So in the, I thought at the time, I thought, right, been doing T-shirts for a while, you know, let's uh, introduce records. So I had started a little record label, but then I, I know Kev Sampson, who'd done the Away Days film, got in touch with him and said, Kev, you know, your soundtrack is amazing for the film, but it only ever came out on CD. What do you fancy? Do you fancy doing an LP? We'll do an LP together. So anyway, I've done like three LPs with him now, two, two about Away Days, and he wrote a book called Stars of Stars, which is based in the 80s and um, based around Liverpool and the riots and that. So we've done a, a, a sort of a soundtrack to that as well and uh, put that out. And then he ends up doing uh, the Nick Love films, the business, uh, Football Factory, and, you know, they've all got great soundtracks. Like, so I knew they hadn't, been, they hadn't come out on vinyl. So I started doing them on vinyl as well. Like, So, you know, it, it's just like, it's a great hobby to have. <laughs> oh, it's a great job to have if you like it, if you, you know, you love your work or whatever. So to be doing LPs and to be doing, you know, the clothing, the clothing's associated with the 80s. It's called 80s casuals, obviously. But the association is obviously the styles and the fashion of that we used to wear in the 80s. So when Liverpool gets to a final, you know, it doesn't matter who you're playing, you're thinking, right, what can we design here? Maybe it's the stadium or how the stadium looked in the 80s or, you know, you're sort of trying to juggle a load of different inspiration to, to come up with a, um, a good T-shirt and that. But, you know, it's like 20 years next year. So, you know, it's, it's lasted well. It pays me wages now because I'm not a printer anymore. And so, you know, we can just keep ticking along, you know, I'm, I'm 60 next year as well, like, so I don't think we've got long left, like, so, yeah, <laughs> we can keep, keep ticking along for a few more years, that'll be good. Well, um, can you believe it's already been an hour? Has it? <laughs> yes, 
mental. <laughs> I said they'll fly, didn't I? <laughs> and then, so before we leave, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you top three films of the eighties for you, and top three oh, you, on the spot. Yeah, and top, top three what? Top top three musical like songs, and then songs. top three top three films. Well, actually. I, I, my aunt fella took me to see The Italian Job when I must have been. I don't know. It came out in 69, so it was only six then. I don't know whether I went then or a few years later, but I was only young. And I have watched that about 30 times or whatever. I know it's like 1969 it came out, so it's not like 80s, but it's 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 just like I'm infatuated with the 60s as well, you know, the fashion and the music and everything then about that period as well. So, like, The Italian Job is, like, you know, one of my favourite films because it's got, like, the fashion, bit of music and, you know, there's the story as well. There's a bit of football involved with the story. But um, another one is The Warriors, 1979. So we're nearly up to the 80s. 79, yeah, I remember that, watching that in um, uh, in Tubruch. You know, Tubruch is a, the, obviously called, uh, I can't think of the name of the cinema now, but, but yeah, watching that there and... Um, yeah, that's had an infatuation. We've done a few T-shirts with Warriors characters on and everything like. And actually, the last vinyl I brought out was a um, seven-inch picture disc with uh, the baseball Furies on one side and the uh, the Warriors on the other side, and four tracks from the film or whatever. But then, um, what was my third one? Be let's just stick it at two two for now because uh, I'll probably be sitting here for about an hour trying to think of another film or whatever. Apocalypse Now and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it's uh well, yeah, them them two stick out, but uh, you know, it's just you know, I don't know. It's just like some some of that. I still go back and watch over and over again. And then what was the other one? Uh, music. Yeah, top th- top three or ish. Uh, well, you know, it was a, the jam were around when you know you first start buying records, probably in your teens and that like so. Uh, you know, by 79, 80 or whatever, do such a wide choice, the specials. I went to see them all. I said, still go to games. Going to see Jamie tomorrow, Jamie Webster at the arena tomorrow. But uh, yeah, still um, still go to the odd gig now and again. Like, But going back then, yeah, we were going every other week and now. And then, um, you know, seeing the jam at D-side, Blondie at D-side. You know, you've got to probably include one of each of them or whatever. Um, orchestral maneuvers were great when they first appeared. The Bunny Men, I've seen, I think the Bunny Men, the most I've seen of a band. So, you know, I can't even pick one, one Bunny Man <laughs> song that would be above all the others. But the Bunny Men, Blondie, the Jam, yeah, there's, yeah, the Coral, even the Coral, fantastic, you know, the last like 20 years or whatever, and still coming up with great albums now. So, yeah. Take your, take your pick from any of them. I'll let you decide <laughs> which ones. There's obviously uh, that many to choose from. And but I've never been asked that before, so I've never, I haven't got a, <laughs> I haven't got a look for you. <laughs> I, I, throw, I thought I'd throw you, throw you for the curve. So, yeah, it, it's curveball, hard. is it called in America? Yeah, curveball. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to come up with a, with a top five because there's so much good music, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. then on now. Uh, and you know what? To the left of me, a record player. Got about four hundred albums, five hundred albums, or whatever. And each day, each afternoon, if I'm working or whatever, rather than put Spotify on or something, I'll put an album on. Or even if I'm driving in the car and I hear a song, and I thought I've got that album, I'll go home and like the the wife has a um, absolute seventies on, so you're hearing songs from the seventies and all that. They're like you know, obviously take you back. So as soon as I get home, I throw a uh, throw I throw the album on if I've heard one song or something. Well, I think that that. Especially with vinyl, I, I DJ as well, and there's there's just nothing like vinyl. Um, but it, it's yeah. it's more than that though, because you know the sleeves were actual artwork as well. Well, that was the reason I started the record label artwork. I started it for local bands in 2012, actually. So my first like probably 12 or 15 releases were seven inch singles. But I stipulated that we need to do good artwork, you know, like whether the band knew an artist or whether I knew a local artist that'll do a nice piece of artwork for it. So, like you say, you've got like your sleeve notes, you've got your your artwork on the front, 
I know like a lot of coloured vinyl and you know picture disc vinyl stuff is around now, like but it, it was always about the artwork on the sleeve, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you'd spend the whole like as soon as you got it, you take the plastic off. Yeah. And yeah. You'd just be looking at every little little thing on on yeah. the front and the back and the, the buckler inside. You'd be just reading it that the entire rest of the night. Yeah. Uh, well, like, like I say, it's like being stuck in the eighties with all the trainers, the t shirts that I'm doing, like the the books writing about the eighties. There's also another one I've, I've recently reissued in eighties casuals. It's called. So it's basically all the photos. Uh, sorry, all the uh, all the labels photographed all the clothes and, and trainers, and it's you know probably 160 pages of all clothes and but just a little write up about each brand, but it's basically just a nostalgia trip. You know, you go through and it's like a feel of Satanta or something or Adidas such and such or Bjorn Borg or and it's just like a, a, a full book of a uh, photog- photography of all the labels from the 80s. But yeah, it's like. 80s books, 80s music, 80s <laughs> fashion or whatever. Like I even got got one of these off off uh, the good guys at um, Stuart's in London. He said, "Oh, you know what we've got in now? Pringle have reissued, and it's the old typeface and the old logo that obviously they haven't used for a long time, mm-hmm. but still in me of." You know, like under eighty pound for a jumper or something or whatever. It's the price of everything's just ridiculous nowadays. Like, but obviously, I said, yeah, send us a jumper. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, they can either say yes or no. Hopefully, it's yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll send you a book instead. <laughs> <laughs> one of the old ones. <laughs> yeah, in return, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then you'll have to buy the new one. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Dave, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, please, if you're in Liverpool, um, come into the match, or if you're just uh, visiting uh, Liverpool, please stop in. Um, like I said, uh, the ex- exhibition still going till March 12th, um, 2023. And if you like your your fashion, 80s style or music, please go to Dave's uh, website, um, 80s casuals limited. It's not limited, it's 80s casuals.co.uk. Oh, I thought it had the LT. No, I thought you were just talking about the business earlier. It's actually 80s casuals. There you go. Oh, See, I'm oh, too strong oh, again. <laughs> Good job, I'm here. I know. Well, I can always go back and edit it to make it me look smarter. <laughs> right. <laughs> But Dave, absolute pleasure, mate. Uh, lovely Enjoyed it, Dan. And, um, uh, you know, when I'm back home, definitely uh, go for a few bevies. Yeah, catch up. Yeah, yeah. Dan, good right, you, mate. Thanks a lot. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening. And um, I will see you later.